I'm going to call today's Civil Justice Subcommittee meeting to order. Uh, and I'm going to call, call the roll. Appreciate that. Representative Carter, Clemens, Here. Curcio, Here. Garrett, Here. Griffey, Here. Ogles, Present. Parkinson, Ramsey, Chairman Farmer. Present. Chairman Farmer, you have a quorum. All right. Thank you so much. Members, do we have anything or anyone like to make any comments or make any personal recognitions before we start today? If not, I'm going to go through the calendar. And we have some items that have been taken off notice or the, sponsors has re the sponsor has requested a roll ahead of time. We're going to go ahead and, and I'm going to go through the calendar and do that. That way, if anybody's sitting here waiting on one of those bills, they can move on and do other things. So looks like item one, uh, House Bill 518. That's by Representative Bricken. Uh, that's, he's requested that bill be taken off notice, and since that bill has been countered for the third time, which has been today, that bill will be moved uh, to a special calendar to be made with a final calendar. So any bills that have been countered three times, if you ask for a roll or even have taken off notice, then that bill is going to be sent to a special calendar uh, to be heard with a final calendar at the end of, the, end of our session here. Uh, item two, without objection. Moving on, item two, House Bill 477 by Representative White. It looks like that'll be taken off notice uh, by sponsor's request without objection. Item three, House Bill 36, that's by Representative Carringer. She's asked that for that to be taken off notice at her request without objection. That'll be taken off notice. Item, moving down to item five by Representative Terry, that's House Bill 1252. Sponsors asked for that to be rolled for a week, so without objection. Moving on down to item number nine by Chairman Jernigan. That item, he's asked for that to be rolled for two weeks. So without objection, members, roll for two weeks. And looks like moving on down to item 14 by Representative Cooper. She's asked that, that be taken off notice. So any objections, seeing none. And that brings us back, unless I've missed something. And I'm looking at a lot of nodding heads, so it looks like we're in good shape. That would bring us back to item four. However, we are going to take, without objection, item seven uh, out of order. Okay. Item seven, and that would be House Bill 25 by Representative Todd. So are you, you're properly before us. Is that, do you have a, an amendment on that, or is that clean? Looks like it's clean. All right. You may proceed. We'll, we'll be okay. Um, may have to see my legal counsel over here for that one after a while, but uh, appreciate you taking me first so I can get to another appointment here. But uh, this bill, as introduced, provides that a person who uses justifiable force against another may request a stay of proceedings in any civil action based on the use of force until the criminal investigation has concluded. It also allows for an immunity hearing at which the court may dismiss an action that is barred by immunity. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to take any questions. And, and thank you for that explanation. And I see a hand up. And you're recognized. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, sponsor, for bringing this legislation. I think it's smart legislation. Be smart for Tennessee. It'll filter out a bunch of cases that don't need to drag on and prevent people from using uh, potential liability as a sword rather than a shield. Uh, so thank you very much for bringing it. I fully support it. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for that, Representative Griffey. Uh, members, any other questions or comments for Representative Todd? Question Representative, Garrett, well, actually, Representative Garrett had a question here. Okay, go ahead. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to make sure I understand, you, you, this bill wouldn't prevent that lawsuit from being filed. You can still file it, and then you still have the ability to ask the judge for it to be stayed, but it's not an automatic. Is that correct? Any follow-up? We good? Uh, yes, yes, sir. That is absolutely correct. correct. It's a choice that the defendant would have uh, to either ask for that stay or not. But if they ask for the stay that meets the qualifications, then the judge must grant that stay. Very good. Thank you, Your President Ogles. You recognize? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. And this may be a question for the legal, but do we clarify the statute of limitations? Is that stay? Does that stay? Uh, pause the, the runtime of the statute of limitations on the civil action? 
Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, my understanding of the Tennessee Rule of Civil Procedure number 16 allows the trial court to conduct a case management conference and therein to address any other matters appropriate to the circumstances of the case. So my understanding uh, from previous presentation of this last year uh, is that it, there is an allowance there that uh, so that evidence is preserved and the rights of the plaintiffs in that civil case are preserved. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I believe, uh, just confirming the legal here, once that case, once that civil case is filed and, and, and a person has secured proper service on that on that summons, and that should stay in place until, I guess this would preclude, uh, I guess, the defendant from filing a motion to dismiss for failure to prosecute. So we should be good from a statute of limitations standpoint. So, members, any other questions? Uh, Representative Clemens? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I was going to make that point, but thank you for doing that. The Also, you know, the issue, one of the concerns I have with um, trying lawsuits is you have memory loss over time with witnesses and, and others. And I suspect if there's a criminal trial going on, then there'll be similar witnesses and they'll be keeping it fresh in their mind. But I just, I, I generally, and we discussed this last night, I appreciate you discussing it with me, I generally t um, have concerns about delaying any legal action and access to the judicial process or a victim's rights, whether right, you know, rightly or wrongly. Um, so, you know, that's my concern with Bill, and I, I think you've got some issues with the witnesses and disappearance of, of things, so uh, I, I, I'd be voting against it. So thank you very much. Appreciate you bringing the bill. Representative Todd, you recognize Yes, sir, and I appreciate your comments and your consideration. Um, under that Civil Procedure Rule 16, uh, states that even if a stay is requested, the court can allow a deposition of a fact witness based on clear showing of ne uh, necessity to preserve evidence. So um, I was concerned about that as well and, and went to that uh, issue in depth last year. Thank you. Okay. okay. Excuse me. Oh, rep okay, you ways. All right, members, looks like are we ready to vote? All right, questions been called. All, all those in favor, send in House Bill 25 to... I'm sorry. Civil Justice Full Committee should have known that. Say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Bill moves on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the Committee. Thank you. That will bring us back to item, item number four. Representative Moody. Thank you, ma'am, and you're properly recognized and before the committee. You've got a motion, you've got a second. Thank you very much, members I, and Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a bill that I was uh, happy to carry last year, uh, and it was brought to me by a constituent who is also our president of the Fraternal Order of Police. And so uh, we got caught up in COVID, and uh, the Senate didn't take it up. So I'm happy to bring it back. I think it's worthy of your consideration. But what this does, we have peer support counselors with our emergency responders. Uh, and so this does not in any way require every department to have one of these. They can, if they don't have one, they can go to one closer to them. It's, it doesn't deal with anything with this, with that. But what this does is we're asking in this bill to consider that when they are counseling a fellow peer and they, ha they use the critical incident stress management, it's a comprehensive and multi-component crisis intervention protocol developed specifically for dealing with traumatic events consisting of multiple crisis intervention components ranging from pre-crisis phase through the acute crisis phase and into the post-crisis phase. It is a formally highly structured and professional recognized process for helping those involved in a critical incident to share their experiences, vent emotions, learn about stress reactions and symptoms, and obtain referral for further help if needed. So what we're asking, they are not in that list of other counseling situations where their, uh, their communication with each other is considered confidential. And of course, in those, in those other instances, if there's a crime committed, they do have to report. But we're asking just to put them in that list of confidentiality. Very good. Members, any questions, comments, Representative Moody? 
Representative Clemens, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to make sure I, we discuss this. I just want to make sure, and I, I realize that peer supporter is very well defined in this in this bill. I just want to make sure that we're not creating this large umbrella of potential people that can be excluded from being a witness or testifying in any action. Because if everyone is designated a peer supporter, even as defined in the bill, you're potentially eliminating a lot of potential witnesses. So I just want you to speak to that and the narrowness of that definition and the fact that we're not creating a large umbrella. Yes. Chair, Chair Moody, you're recognized. Thank you, thank you for that. And it is my understanding that which, you know, I'm not in the middle of it, but it is my understanding that it will not, it will not do that. That's not the intent. Okay, thank you, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank I'm sorry, you. thank you. Members, Representative Griffey, you recognize me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative uh, Chair Lady Moody for bringing this legislation. Um, I want to express my concern regarding not just this legislation, but there's also been a, a, a legislation proposed that would expand the privilege for rape crisis counselors, for instance. Uh, under Tennessee Rules of Evidence, we already have a fairly uh, established list of individuals who are exempt from testifying at trial uh, if they've had private consultations with a defendant or, or other party. Um, we have spousal privileges, physician client, attorney client, investigators with the attorney. My concern is that um, statements, we have a, a long tradition in American jurisprudence that if someone has knowledge about an event, they can be required by subpoena to have to come to court and testify under oath. So we all know the jury gets to hear what the facts are about a case. And my concern is by expanding these privileges, we are slowly whittling away at that fundamental right of jurisprudence in America. And I, 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 unfortunately, I don't feel like that this is good policy because if we do it for the law enforcement consultant and the rape crisis folks who wanna do it, and I, I'm concerned that we're gonna slowly create problems for uh, folks in the courtroom so every person who's on trial for a criminal offense or, or has a civil dispute that they're trying to get to the truth of the facts, that their inability to ask people questions about what was said and what statements were made is gonna be undermined. So with those concerns, I, I respectfully don't feel like I can support the legislation, but thank you for bringing it. Thank you. And I had under section two there, <coughs> two. Excuse me. Section two. Two. There's language that says, unless otherwise required by law, the rule of the court. So it sounds like an individual could be subpoenaed, and then that'd be up to the judge whether or not to allow that to come into evidence or how to handle that. So I think we do have a mechanism to get some testimony in if we, if, if a person were to need it. Representative Griffey, you recognize that. And I, that's the way I understood the way the proposed bill was written, that you would have to, if someone had facts or the problem is, how are you gonna know if they have facts if they may have talked to a, another witness, but they refuse to discuss with you what was said? You know, you have no ability. So you could go to the judge and say, judge, I wanna subpoena this person. They talked to the defendant, or the defendant talked to them. Uh, so I want them to come to trial, and the judge would go, well, what do they know? Well, I don't know, because I don't have no ability. He won't talk to me. I can't find out the underlying facts. And I, I'm just I'm concerned with that situation I think it would be better if we have a presumption that someone can be called to testify and find out if they have information. Uh, and if they don't want to come, then it's then the judge, they can always seek a, a protective order and say, judge, this is harassment or whatever, and I don't really have any facts about the case. If, if a person doesn't want to testify at a proceeding, whether it's civil or criminal, they can always tell the attorney for whatever party it is, look, they said X, Y, and Z, it's got nothing to do with the case or whatever, if you call me to testify, that's what I'm gonna to testify to under oath. And generally, they're not forced by subpoena to show up uh, under those circumstances. If someone has relevant information, they may not wanna disclose it, and a lot of times they won't talk to the investigator uh, for whatever party it is, and that's what sort of forces attorneys to have to subpoena those witnesses to come into court 
and they generally have some sort of relevant information that the jury may want to consider, the fact finder may want to consider. So that's why I'm, I'm just hesitant to support this legislation. But thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Members? Uh, Chairman Moody, any follow-up? Well, I did, I, we did speak last night, and um, I didn't know if it would help. Of course, we're here in sub, but uh, I'm, at, I'm at the will of what the committee thinks. Um, I don't know enough about the law and all that, but I just know that when they brought it to me, that that was not the intent that I got from them. It was just strictly these, it's another fellow coworker that is trained in this intervention that you're able to just be that initial, let you know, letting off steam or whatever that, I just, I just think when we're thinking about our, and I, I'm not put, I don't mean to put any words in your mouth, that they are, you know, the police have cameras, the, I don't know, you know, just the things that I'm thinking of as a layperson where there would be maybe evidence that they need to follow up on with someone, but uh, it, it's a worthy discussion, and uh, I can get more information for you if you if you need it. I actually have someone a peer supporter here in, in Metro Nashville that I met with last year that, uh, you know, I could get to come testify um, if y'all feel like you need that. But um, I do think just from what the nature of their work and the trauma that they do see and care for, it's not just the law enforcement, it's, you know, the firefighters and your emergency first responders that this would cover. So um, I'm at your will. Representative Garrett, you're recognized. Chairman Moody, thank you very much for bringing the bill. We talked last night, too, and I um, wanted to express my support for the bill, because I do believe it's narrowly drawn enough that if there is evidence that needs to be before the judge, that there's an avenue for that. Um, but it may be uh, possible, and I would only suggest this, but, uh, uh, but always hearing from maybe a DA or maybe the person that you're referring to would be very helpful, uh, since I don't prosecute in the criminal world, so I certainly don't know all the steps you take as a district attorney of what information that you need to obtain to prosecute someone that's committed a crime, uh, but I would certainly like to hear from those. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to make a suggestion if you if you roll this till next week, and maybe we can have, hear some testimony on a specific instance where this might be helpful to the DA or might be or not be unhelpful on the defense side to see what would happen in this particular situation so we can understand which I believe the bill's drawn that way to provide that evidence that needs to be obtained for court purposes. Uh, would that be something you might be open to if we could do that? Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to get that, my contact here in Nashville. Great, okay. thank, thank you very much, list. Madam Chairman. And I have two members on the list before we do anything. I have Representative Clemens and I have Representative Griffey. I, I wave, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Representative Griffey, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the concerns on trying to fix the bill, and I'm certainly willing to try to, if we can make, come up with uh, amendments or something that might make it better. Here's, here's, one, here's my concern, and when the rape crisis counselors came with their legislation last year, re requesting support for their, to be able to exempt the counselors from having to appear in court, I said, okay, if you wanna do that, we have to have some fundamental process for disclosure of truthful, relevant information, uh, and somebody's got a legal requirement to do that. So I says, why don't you amend the bill that says, if you have rate counseling, the counselor is going to have to submit a report to the district attorney general's office of all truthful, relevant information concerning those discussion. And then there's a, there's a legal obligation on the DA's office to disclose any Brady material, any material that might be possible uh, possibly favorable to the accused or might lead to uh, discovery of favorable evidence for the accused. So if you if you had a requirement, if they have counseling, that the counselor must submit a report to the district attorney's office if it's a criminal matter, um, I, I think that might, I think it would be an improvement. I, I still have hesitations, but I think that might be an improvement. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Chair Lee. Thank bringing. you. And, and thank you for that. And I, and I think there are ways that we could craft in order to have, I mean, judges have ed evidentiary hearings all the time pre-trial. You know, we, we went through transcripts of, of depositions and, and we redacted and there's, 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 there's many ways and methods that we can do. And I, and I think that Representative Garrett has a good point. We roll it for a week, we can work on it, look at it, make sure we've, we've tidied everything up. And yeah. 
I agree, Fair and enough. I'm happy to work on it with you and appreciate your suggestions and insight. All right. Members, looks like we, without objection, roll this. <coughs> We're going to roll House Bill 167 one week from today without Thank objection. You. Thank you. Thank you, committee. That br <clears throat> Excuse me. That brings us down to, of course, item five's roll. That brings us to item six, uh, House Resolution 23 by Chairman Rudd. And you're properly recognizing before the committee. Thank you, committee. Um, I'm going to respectfully ask, um, unless there's any questions, I'm going to respectfully ask to roll this to the final calendar of the committee. We have members out. My witness's wife is in the hospital. I have both Senate and House members wanting to add to this resolution other items, which I'm not totally for. I need to meet with them. So I respectfully ask to roll this to the final calendar of the committee, which I believe be about three weeks. All right, members, before we take any action on that, we do have, we do have folks that have notified our office as per our rules to testify. Uh, on this on this bill and you had said your your witness we we didn't get any notice of any witness that you had did you send an email or well david i think david fowler had asked to speak yes. okay his wife's in the hospital this morning surgery okay all right he had i believe he had sent a video which that's against our rules as well an individual has to be here to testify yes Katie's i understand plus and it's such forth so we've lengthier than his yes i understand that very very good but what I'm going to do, we're, we're, we're going to allow these folks to come up here and testify today, unless I have any objection from the committee members. We have folks that's taking time out of their day to be here. So I'm going to allow them to be heard, and then we'll take up, uh, we'll take up your request after that. All right, so without objection, we're going to go out of session. Now, we're going to hear from, uh, I have uh, Celeste Herbert on the docket. Excuse me, the calendar. Good morning. Good morning. Man, you can stand there at the at the podium, or you can have a seat there. Um, there's a button that should illuminate a red light once you push it to face with some like speaking ripples coming out of it. And then, uh, if you could just keep your comments to three minutes, and after that, we'll have unlimited time for questions. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Celeste Huffman Herbert. I'm from Knoxville, and I appreciate the opportunity to address you all this morning. I practice law in Knoxville for almost 40 years. I'm here this morning as a lawyer who supports an independent judiciary, but I'm also here this morning to give you a personal view of Ellen Hobbs Lyle as a person, as a woman, who has dedicated over 25 years of her life to the citizens of Davidson County and to the citizens of the state of Tennessee. Ellen and I quickly began, became friends when we started law school in 1978. We were both young women from Middle Tennessee. I was from Brentwood, Ellen was from Nashville, and on the Hobbs side of her family, she goes back five generations here in Davidson County. Uh, she traces her roots to a farm off of Hobbs Road. Her mother's people are from Fluellen, Tennessee, near Springfield in Robertson County. Ellen is one of the kindest and smartest people that I know. She graduated near the top of our law class and was hired by a huge law firm in Houston, Texas. But her ties to Tennessee pulled her back home. She had a successful law practice and was appointed chancellor of the Davidson County by then Governor Don Sunquist. Ellen has served this state with distinction. She is one of the top trial judges in this state. Our Tennessee Supreme Court tapped her in 2015 to head up the business court pilot project. Her expertise and her reputation as a fair and honest judge has impacted uh, all of us. She is honest. For a three year period, she served as the business court judge and handled 110 complex business cases in addition to maintaining her regular docket. During that same per time period that she took on the business court, she visited her mother in an assisted living every single day before she took the bench and on weekends when she wasn't working. Her court was awarded a community service award for a program that was designed with the Tennessee Commission on Aging 
and Disability that oversees a distribution of a $40 million fund to the elderly across our state. The resolution proposed by Representative Rudd suggests that Ellen pursued a personal and partisan agenda in the voting case that came before her last summer. Respectfully, the only agenda that Chancellor Lyle has been advancing is an agenda of service to the great state of Tennessee. When the Supreme Court reviewed her decision, it had the ability to not remand the case to her if they had thought that she had mishandled the case. I actually have with me this morning a transcript of a hearing on June the 11th, 2020, that I would like for you all to have an opportunity to review. Uh, the, the transcript provides context on several of the remarks uh, that were taken out of context made by Chancellor Lyle. I urge you to not advance this resolution. She's a faithful public servant, just like all of you. I appreciate your service, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today. And, and thank you for that. Members, does anyone have any questions or comments for Ms. Herbert? Okay, Resident Griffey, you're recognized, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, Ms. Herbert, for being here. Ms. Herbert, I appreciate your, you indicated your friendship of Chancellor Lyle, and, uh, uh, and uh, we appreciate you being here and wanting to speak on her behalf. Let me ask you, do you do agree that under the Tennessee Constitution that this body has uh, uh, check and balance over the state judiciary by the power to remove judges and other elected officials? I, I agree, and in fact, you're going to hear uh, from Judge Riley, who's going to uh, talk with you a little bit about those powers. Okay. And you indicated you had some transcripts. Do you have transcripts from all the proceedings that involved the election case that uh, Chancellor Lyle was uh, hearing? Or I do not, Harper, but right. I could hey, I could get those me. for you. Let me let me say one thing. I'll recognize the speakers. That way, we don't get into a running running debate. Let's go see this. So. You're recognized. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I, I have just one transcript from the June 11, 2020 hearing, but we could certainly get those transcripts to you, you all for your review. Thank you. Representative Griffey. And my apologies for jumping out of turn okay. to Mr. Chairman and Ms. Uh, Ms. Hobbs Herbert for that. So uh, I, I, I would request, I, I think it would benefit uh, the entire General Assembly if the entire transcripts concerning that case were made available for those that would like to review them, to review the case. And let me ask this, Ms. Herbert, do you, or do you know whether, and I haven't had a chance to go through all the transcripts, so I've just heard anecdotal information, but that Chancellor Lyle did uh, indicate that uh, our state uh, elections coordinator, Mark Goins, or and our Secretary of State, Trey Hargett, uh, she indicated that if they didn't do something, they could be facing uh, contempt. Ms. Herbert, you're recognized. That comment is in this transcript that I have for your review, and I think that those remarks um, require some context, Mr. Griffey. Okay. Representative Griffey, any follow-up? No, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Herbert, for being here. Thank Members, you. Any additional questions or comments for Ms. Herbert before I excuse her? Seeing none, thank you so much. That thank was you. That was very helpful. And next on the list we have uh, Bob Boston. Bob. Insert same same protocol. Yes, uh, you can stand or sit, however you feel comfortable. There's a, a button and you push it, the red light will come on and just keep your remarks to right at three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Farmer. I've spent my career standing up, speaking to court. I'll do so here. But that's fine. However um, you feel comfortable, that's members fine with of the us. Members the committee and uh, Member Rudd, my name is Bob Boston. I'm a practicing lawyer in Nashville. I've practiced here for 38 years, all before the courts here. I'm speaking in a representative capacity as well as for myself on behalf of a grassroots committee that has been denominated the Committee for an Independent Judiciary. It was formed last um, Wednesday. It went live. Last Friday, it now has 671 members that have signed on to that committee, sharing the views that I'm going to express to the committee today. Chairman Rudd, thank you, or Member Rudd, thank you for rolling this to allow additional input to be um, provided to the committee. And just I, to be clear, 
Uh, this bill has not been rolled. Excuse we are me. out of session right now, and we'll take that matter up once we, we go back into session. Thank you, Chairman Farmer. I just spoke. The, 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 my committee believes that William Rehnquist, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, spoke prophetically back in 1996 about what faces, what faces you today. Justice Rehnquist, if you'll recall, was Barry Goldwater's national campaign chairperson in 1964. He was appointed to the Supreme Court by Ronald Reagan. His conservative credentials are without question. In a speech in 1996, Justice Rehnquist posited that the notion of an independent judiciary was then by the framers of the Constitution, an original idea. It had not been accepted. He also noted and properly placed and phrased that independence as a crown jewel of the American system. He also, and going to my next point, stated that there is a right way and a wrong way to place the imprint of popular view and opinion on the judiciary. What the country faces now in the state of Tennessee as well in a lesser, a lesser way is finding the proper pr imprint of popular opinion. In this case, Chancellor Lyle was faced with a randomly assigned difficult issue which she considered under the prevailing law. Whether or not she made the right decision or not is subject to debate amongst every citizen of the state of Tennessee. But what is the right way to challenge that, as Justice Rehnquist would ask us? The right way is, is pursuant to the three ways, the Tennessee, two ways the Tennessee Constitution and one way the Tennessee Code already, already allows it, to be removed or challenged by impeachment and, re, and retained, or to be removed for unfitness or for a complaint to be made to the, to the Board of Judicial Conduct. All three ways exist. Justice Rehnquist would suggest, and my committee does as well, that the appellate process is the first way by which this type of decision gets challenged, and it was used here, and it was used successfully. Instant replay was started in 1963 by CBS TV. Since that time, it has been used to review decisions to ensure their correctness or incorrectness. That's what happened here. The system worked. Second, Tennessee trial judges are elected and have been since 1834. Election comes up from time to time. If, just, if Judge Lyle has made an improper decision that the people of Tennessee believe is not uh, reflective of their views, the election process works. I'm not here to speak on behalf of Judge Lyle. I'm here to speak on behalf of an independent judiciary. She is, by most reports, mine included, a stellar jurist. And she sir, is I'm going to the the stop head. you right there just with your uh, initial comments, and we're going to have plenty of time for, plenty of time for questions. Uh, your, three, your three minutes is up. So, Thank members, you. do we have any, any follow-up questions or comments uh, for Mr. Boston? Representative Clemens, you're recognized, and I have two more on the list after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Boston, for being here. appreciate all of our guests taking the time to be here out of their busy practices and schedules. Uh, can you speak to the importance of an independence judici judiciary? Mr. Boston, you're recognized. Thank you. I'll do it in this fashion. I wish I want to ask the, uh, the members of the committee to envision a scenario with me. Assume that your son, daughter, niece, or nephew is playing their first sporting event. Assume it's baseball at the kids' league. Assume that they come with trepidation, excitement, nervousness, yet hope. Now assume that that's what happens when you go to court for the first time. You come to the ball game and you have been told the role of the players, the coach, and the umpire. The umpire's job is important to the game. In fact, it's critical. If she or he is influenced by the parents of the other team because they don't want a ball to be a ball, an out to be a, a safe, they object, and if they can remove the umpire, the integrity of the game is gone. It never returns. That is exactly what happens in a court of law if the independence of a judge at the trial level is threatened by an outside influence that is not one of the parties before it. No longer do the parties come to court and get the expectation of neutrality and independence that our Constitution preserves. It changes the game, and baseball is never the same. Representative Clemens, any follow-up? 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, thank you, Mr. Boston. You know, the independence of, of a judiciary um, seems to have been contemplated pretty clearly by the founders, um, especially not only the U.S. Constitution, but in our Tennessee Constitution, uh, the most recent version, of course. Um, can you speak a little bit more to the type of calls that is contemplated by Article 6 for removal? And when specifically the legal calls that is generally would justify removal under Article 6. Mr. Boston, you recognize. Yeah, I can, uh, Representative Clemens, thank you. In the history of Tennessee, two judges have been removed for the, in essence, criminal conduct based upon what they did while they were on the bench. Judges have been brought before the, the Board of Judicial Conduct, which is similar to the Board of Professional Responsibility, and unfortunately it happens regularly for either merit, merit or meritless complaints. In addition, the, the uh, legislature and the government has the power to remove for unfitness by impeachment or le uh, legislative action. The question before this committee and the legislator now with the situation that Judge Lyle was asked to deal with does not fall with any of those categories. When those categories are applicable, the procedures are in place for them to be used. If they're used, they are there in the Constitution twice, in the Tennessee Code once. There are three places by which um, a remedy could be found. Any follow-up, Representative Clements? Yes, and I, I just, again, would like to, uh, you touched on this. Uh, you know, those of us who are lawyers, we, we win some and we lose some. <laughs> Often wrong, but never in doubt, I think one of my old partners used to say. Um, there is a process in place. The judicial system is constructed in such a way, and again, I'm just reiterating kind of the point you made about the appellate process. The appellate process in this specific instance played out, and it played out. Some people didn't like it. Some people did like it, but it worked. Would you agree with that? I would. Yeah, Mr. Boston, you're back in us. I'm sorry. Excuse me. You're fine. I need to come more often. I apologize. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> Maybe not. Let's hope we don't need it. Take, take the advice of counsel. <laughs> yeah. right. but anyway, yeah. Well, thank you. you for being here. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you uh, taking the time away from your practice. And I had Representative Garrett on the list. He passes. And now I have Representative Griffey. You're on the list, sir. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Boston, for being here. Yes, I appreciate sir. your remarks and comments. Let me ask you this, Mr. Boston, uh, in your analogy about the baseball game, what if the umpire says, well, you know what, I'm going to let this team have three extra players? Yeah, who, 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 excuse me, who enforces, uh, who makes sure that the umpire follows the actual rules of baseball? What? Or, or excuse me, Mr. Boston, you're recognized. In your, in your question, and I appreciate that, I think it depends on the rules of baseball that are in place that govern it. For example, taking that one, it could be the commissioner, it could be the person that hires the umpire, it could be the procedures that are already in place that are designed to correct the issue just described. The result that you, pre that you presented to me would be wrong. It would be erroneous. It wouldn't be within the law of the land or the law of the rules of baseball. In my example with Judge Lyle and the situation she was faced with, the proper step would go to the Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals and or the Supreme Court here by direct report allowed it to be questioned and challenged. President Griffey, any follow-up? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So let me ask you this, and Mr. Boston, who, uh, who has to enforce the provisions that make sure our uh, justices, our judges, do not uh, engage in legislating policy from the bench? How do we enforce that in Tennessee? Mr. Boston? through the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals, through that process first. The Supreme Court is designed, as I've always understood it and be taught, to help apply the law of the land and the policy of the state. They're the ultimate arbiter of that. If the law needs to be changed, clarified, or expanded, it's the legislature's role. Here, Judge Lyle was asked to make a call on a ball and a strike under existing law, and she did so, which obviously was just, just many people disagreed with, many people supported. But you go to the Court of Appeals and there were the Supreme Court with direct report. I think the system worked as it was supposed to here. Representative Griffey. So let me ask you, which branch of government has the duty and responsibility to make sure 
that their authority is not encroached by another branch of government. Mr. Boston? Supreme Court is the ultimate arbitrator of how the law is applied by whom. The legislature does have an obligation to set the law and adapt it and ask that it be applied. The court system, as I understand it, and as I believe the Constitution of the state of Tennessee, is the arbiter of whether it was done. Representative Griffey, any follow-up? So if the judicial branch, whether it's the Supreme Court or a particular judge or a DA that announces publicly, I'm not going to enforce the laws that the uh, legislature has passed, who has the responsibility and authority to make sure that that judicial official, that Supreme Court justice, that district attorney actually obeys the laws that the legislature, that we all come up here and pass? Who has the ultimate responsibility to enforce that sanction against a member of another branch that is acting outside the law, outside the constitutional law? Mr. Boston. The ultimate responsibility remains with the judiciary. The implementation of their decision is done by the executive branch through law enforcement and or the DA's office or one of those offices. Representative Griffey, you're recognized. Mr. Boston, why do you think we have in the Tennessee Constitution the authority to remove a judge for cause to ouster or through simply a two-thirds vote? Mr. Boston. I do not know how it got in there, Representative. I wish I did. My assumption is it was because it preserved a balance that was designed to get the right decision, the right result, which is my point, respectfully, to the, the need to imprint popular opinion throughout the state of Tennessee. For example, if there is an issue that becomes prevailing important in the state of Tennessee, all legislatures are subject to being elected or not elected because of how that's viewed. I believe judges are in the same situation, but it falls to the electorate to make the change, to implement that public policy if it needs to be changed. Representative Griffey, any follow-up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So here's what I'm trying to delineate uh, with this issue that we're discussing. Um, would you agree that the legislature, the General Assembly gets to decide who gets to vote by absentee ballot or not. Isn't that the legislature's responsibility? Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. I'm okay. sorry. And would it be improper for any judge in the state of Tennessee to change that policy without going through the legislature? If, if, Mr. Boston, you recognize. If a judge did it for personal view or for a political issue, it would be improper. If, it, if that judge was asked to apply the law as he or she understood it in a question of some substantively important but questionable view of either side, he or she should make the call. The litigants in the case, because they represent the two competing issues before him or her, should then take it through the court system, which is what I've been, I argue has happened here successfully. Mr. Griffey. Well, but there's not a provision in the Tennessee Constitution about ouster removal. It says based upon the personal intent of the judge or the uh, political intent of the judge. It just says we can remove it by two-thirds vote, does it not? It does. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Boston. Appreciate it. Thank you. Fair enough, members. Any follow-up, uh, any questions or further comments? Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you, sir. Uh, it just just the real, the very basics of civics. The judicial branch's purpose is to interpret the law. Am I correct? Mr. Boston, you're recognized. Thank you. You are correct. And based on what the judge did, she made an interpretation of the law as she saw it, right? Mr. Boston? That is exactly what she did. Representative Parkinson? And when it was not agreed upon, the for those that didn't agree with it they went through the chain based on what the law says by uh moving it to the in appeals moving it in appeals if i'm not if mr boston it actually worked better than that representative in this case chancellor lyle had an option of granting an immediate appeal or not the issue was of some importance for all of you and everyone remembers it was because the timing of it in connection with the august election at that point, the trial judge had the ability not to allow an immediate appeal, which would have required, in this case, the state of Tennessee to take it by way of a direct application to get the Supreme Court to order it. Judge Lyle did not. If there was some 
uh, motivation on her part, which I do not believe in any shape or fashion there was, all she had to do was not grant that petition for an immediate appeal. She did just the opposite, which brought it up through the system as my constituency and myself contends is the appropriate way to do it. She gave the state the best it could after she called the ball that was pitched a ball or a strike. Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with that understanding that it is the judges, and I'm, I'm saying this for all the viewers too, um, and, and I apologize if I'm being very um, uh, elementary with, amongst all these attorneys in here. Um, I'm probably the n only non-attorney in here. Uh, but but it is the it is the the job of the judicial branch to interpret the law as we draft write, write the law, and pass bills into law, and if we want to that interpretation to be different, then we need to clarify the law. Am I correct, Mr. Bolton? With one caveat, I would make to your comment. I think the judiciary's job is to do exactly what you said but building on what other judges and other courts over time has done, the precedential value of learning over time. Once that is applied, the judge has done what they're supposed to. If the law is unclear, if it needs to be strengthened or weakened or changed, to reflect the popular imprint, to use the words I've used from Justice Rehnquist, that's the legislature's job, to change it in a way that it then could be interpreted differently if the legislature believes that and any other judge misapplied it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Members, any further questions, comments for Mr. Boston? Representative Griffey, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Boston, even if Chancellor Lyle had not granted permission for immediate appeal, the lawyers could still appeal to the Supreme Court and ask them to review the actions of Chancellor Lyle. Could they not have? Mr. Boston? Yes, yeah, I could. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Clemens, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Boston, are you familiar enough with the the appellate court's decisions and the position of the AG's office to answer a question on that? I, would, I, can, yeah, I, I apologize. I'm too used to jumping in quickly. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I will try to. I think I may be. Okay. I, my, my question is, isn't it correct that the Attorney General's office reversed its position on a key legal question between the trial court and the appellate court? Mr. Boston, I right. believe it reversed its position on two critical issues out of three. At the trial court, they were asserted one way. By the time that the decision was entered and taken to the Court of Appeals, the state of Tennessee, in my terminology, backed off of those two points, leaving one for the Supreme Court, which then did overrule Chancellor Lyle and, and implemented the law as it said it should be implemented, which is its job. Representative Clements. Exactly. So the state then, ultimately, what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, agreed with Chancellor Lyle on two points of law and then overruled her on the third. Therefore, whether you agree with her or disagree with her, you almost got it both ways. Mr. I mean, is that a fair statement? Mr. Boston, you recognize. I, I, I don't know if the state of Tennessee ultimately would have agreed with Chancellor Lyle on the first two points. But after her ruling, it did. The fact of the matter is it did change its position consistent with her point. Whether it was done for efficiencies or to avoid the ultimate outcome that it may have feared would happen, many times a litigant will take a change of position to avoid an ultimate loss. Whether the state of Tennessee was trying to do that or it ultimately did agree with her view of those two attributes of her decision is unknown to me. The final result, though, is two of the three that she ruled on were accepted by the state of Tennessee and dropped before it got to the Supreme Court or as it got to the Supreme Court. Representative Clemens, any follow-up? So, yes, sir. Uh, from your experience as an attorney, and sometimes we do change positions between steps of the appellate process, it's generally because we see the writing on the wall, that our, our legal argument is not as strong um, in other areas as it could be, and we have a feeling that we're going to get an adverse decision on that, thus creating more precedent. Um, in this case, do you have an opinion as to whether or not the state changed course because it didn't believe its legal argument to be strong um, as opposed to Chancellor Lyle's ruling? Mr. Boston, you recognize. The state of Tennessee, in my experience, is represented by some of the best lawyers in the state. 
they are talented, they're skillful, they understand the law. I think they made the right decision to drop those two claims, as I would have too if I'd been representing the state of Tennessee. Prescient might be the right word. Predicting what could happen if you didn't do that is something that lawyers avoid. I do not want to take a position that is a loser. Perhaps that is what faced the state of Tennessee. It would be a better answer to the question, but my supposition is yes, it made the right decision based on the eventual outcome it faced. Representative Clemens, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Boston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Chairman Curcio, I have you on the list, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Boston, for being here. Do you, do you, are you familiar enough with the, this process to know when the last time the legislature would have entertained something like this? Mr. Boston? Uh, I, I do not know. I would be pleased to find and provide that information to the committee if it's appropriate to do so. I thank do you. not know the timing of it. I think I have it, but I don't have it at my beck and call this morning. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, Absolutely. I, if you don't recall the exact timing, do you know do you know the reason why the legislature may have engaged in this, Mr. Boston? I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I'm following your question. I want to make sure I answer it directly. Do you mean when the legislature has acted to remove or challenge a judge based upon an, a ruling or an order? Or, Chairman Curcio. Thank you. More generally, when the legislature has acted to remove a judge, and and why did we do it? The, the, very good. The, the two that I recall, I can provide the situation. I believe they were both judges from Davidson County. They go back at least, I remember, I've been here 38 years. They both happened during my career, and they were based on either criminal or quasi-criminal activity. And I will provide, it with permission, that information to the committee. Very good. Chairman Curcio? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that, that's, that was exactly what my recollection was as well, is that that was more for criminal-related yep. behavior. I, I also look to the federal system to see um, when when impeachment of, of judges has has taken place, and I was interesting to find interested to find uh, the first three instances the United States Senate took up um, impeachment uh, of a member of the judiciary. The first reason was for treason, which seems like a good reason uh, to impeach someone. The second one was for drunkenness and insanity, which uh, again seems like a pretty pretty good uh, pretty good reason, and also would you know speak more to criminality as opposed to a ruling, but what I, the reason I'm going down memory lane is because in 1804, you had a federal government that was dominated by, by Federalists for, for many years. Uh, and then uh, in 1801, the Republican Party gained control and elected Thomas Jefferson president, of course, one of our founders who helped set up this entire process. And uh, there was a, a Supreme Court justice at that time named Samuel Chase. They called him Old Bacon Face, which is an awesome nickname. Um, I guess it had to do with his complexion. I don't know. But, uh, but Thomas Jefferson uh, stated that um, he, he orchestrated an impeachment trial of Samuel Chase, stating that he declared he would wipe the floor with the obnoxious justice because he disagreed with him so vehemently on his political views. So uh, the articles of impeachment were brought, and the House managers uh, accused Justice Chase of tending to prostitute the high judicial character with which he was invested to the low purpose of, electioneering, of an electioneering partisan. And uh, there was this huge debate uh, because the Senate had only acted on this twice before, uh, again, once for treason, next for insanity and drunkenness, and now third for disagreeing with the opinions of the justice. Uh, and there was a long trial, but ultimately, the majority, supermajority, in fact, of Republicans sided against their president, the venerable Thomas Jefferson, uh, and, and forever in, insulated the judiciary from um, uh, congressional attacks, which I thought was relevant today. I, I think uh, all of us can disagree politically, uh, but when we look back in Tennessee's history, at the federal history, we're looking more to criminal acts. We're looking to... Um, judges that would abuse their power. A couple of years ago, I was asked to work with Senator Bell down the hall uh, on kind of reforming the Board of Judicial Conduct because it had become a committee that was out of step with modern Tennessee and uh, was uh, in many ways unable to perform its duties. Uh, because of the great work done by Senator Bell, uh, predominantly, I won't take much credit, uh, he, he was uh, a very impassioned uh, part of, of that piece, but we, we worked together very, very hard 
to make sure that the Board of Judicial Conduct could do its job. And so I, I just want to point out kind of historically the gravity of what we're talking about here and, and, and what this power, which is vested in us by the Constitution, is typically reserved for. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence, and thank you for being here today. Any, any follow-up to that, Mr. Balson? Yes, yes, um, Chairman Farmer, very briefly. The, w with the committee's permission, the, I would like to provide the text of the speech that I mentioned that Justice Rehnquist gave. It tells the story of Samuel Chase back in the 1800s when he was sought to be removed directly by an instruction from Thomas Jefferson based upon Jefferson's view of Chase's political sway one way or another. It was rejected. The speech goes into that. There is a second historical context where the, where the executive branch, rather than the legislative branch here, which is where the resolution is filed, but in that case where the executive branch tried to do the same thing. Um, back during the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt, you recall, attempted to stack the court with additional uh, justices of his view of how polit the political issue and, and needs of the time should be implemented and attempted to make the Supreme Court of the, of the country to 15 justices. That was, in a bipartisan way, rejected by the Congress of the United States because it was designed to change the independence to a view that was supportive of his political agenda. There, my constituency and those that I speak of today and for myself, there is no criticism that's offered for legislators who wish to apply the, what their view of the law of the land. Respectfully, I believe that's why we elect you to do so. You react for your constituency. Here, though, it's the method by which that is being done because it is an attack on the judiciary's job to apply the law and interpret it as it believes it should be rather than be removed when it doesn't. And, and thank you for that. So any, any literature that anyone may want to provide this committee, just email it to my office, and I'll be sure that the committee members have it. Thank you, Chairman Farmer. And thank you for that. Members, do we have any follow-up or comments or questions to that? Representative Griffey, I see your finger. I apologize, Mr. Chairman, for being long. Uh, I just, Mr. Boston, let me ask you, what, what should the General Assembly do if, a, say, a DA just announces he's not going to enforce a particular law passed by legislature? What's, what's the recourse? What should the legislature do? Mr. Boston, you recognize it. Two, two things, in my view, uh, member. Um, one, the follow the procedures that are in place to remove that individual if they need to be done. Second, change the law to make it clear. And other, other ways to do that, change must, you know, shall to must, must to, uh, rather than it being a discretionary view, you change the, the teeth of the law if it is unclear. Representative Griffey, any follow-up? Well, and the, the process for removing, say, if it's a DA, for example, for not, uh, not following the law that they took an oath to follow would be removal by two-thirds vote, uh, perhaps in both houses of the General Assembly, would it not? Mr. Boston, you're recognized. I, I wish I knew the total procedure, but it would be pursuant to either of the constitutional provisions or the, the Board of Judicial Conduct. I just don't know the vote total. Okay. I haven't studied that as, on that part. Thank you. Members, any additional questions or comments for Mr. Boston? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you for indulging me. I appreciate you listening to my comments. You're welcome. And uh, I have Judge Joe Riley on my list next. And Judge, I, I know you've heard this twice before. You can, you can stand or sit however you feel more comfortable. Just be sure that red light's on. And uh, we'll give you uh, right at three minutes there to give us an opening, and then we can ask questions from there. I testified, so I'll apologize in advance for not being recognized. I'm not used to that. And, and, and that's okay. You know, a lot of people have that problem. It's just... Uh, they're not used to it, for one. And two, I just, I just want to make it clear to those who are watching, you know, by video or, or maybe sitting out in the crowd, and a lot of people may not understand or practice, you know, law. So we just try to keep it clear for folks. So thank you. I understand, and I'll, I'll try to remember. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, I'm very humbled to be here. Uh, I'm an old country boy who lives and I believe to be the poorest county in our state. And I drove up last night to appear before this august body today to express my passion for 
for something and some things that I believe in. And in expressing my passion, I don't intend to be offensive, so I hope I'm not. Uh, but I'm proud of what I'm about to say in terms of our judiciary in Tennessee. So you'll understand where I'm coming from. I was a circuit court judge for about 18 years on the Tennessee Court of Appeals for about seven. Thereafter, I prosecuted, investigated, I should say investigated and prosecuted Tennessee judges for misconduct as the chief disciplinary counsel in the state of Tennessee. I reviewed hundreds of complaints, and that was a tough job. That was a tough job. Most of the complaints came from disgruntled litigants who lost. It didn't fare too well. Since that time, I've been teaching uh, to lawyers across the state in the seminar business. Two of the topics I cover are recent legislation. I've been doing that for years, so I review all the legislation uh, you pass, and I talk about that. But I also cover the United States Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution, and collaterally, Tennessee Constitution. And I have come to respect those documents. I've come to respect Tennessee legislation. You are right. Judges have an obligation to enforce statutes. I had to do it even though I didn't agree with them from time to time. Unless they're unconstitutional. Unless they're unconstitutional. No statute can violate our Constitution. And judges are put in that position sometimes and put in the position of having to interpret your legislation in light of the Constitution. I've read H.R. 23, and with all due respect, it sounds eerily familiar with what I used to receive when I was chief disciplinary counsel about other judges. Someone lost. They don't like it. They believe the judge is biased. That's another usual allegation. It wasn't fair. And the judge didn't follow the law. Lots of those from disgruntled litigants. And that's basically what it is, I believe, respectfully. Respectfully. But it's more sophisticated, properly drawn, but the result is the same. We do have a process for dealing with these types of issues. Number one, we have an appellate process that's recognized by your statutes, by the rules of procedure, et cetera. We've talked about, you've talked about that today. And I'm gonna stop you, and I'm gonna stop you right there, Thank right you. there, your three minutes has expired, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna have any comments or questions to follow up on what you were saying. So members, do we have any Thank questions or comments for Judge Riley on that? Uh, Representative Garrett, you're recognized. I don't necessarily have a comment, Mr. Chairman, but would you, I would like to hear an opportunity for you to conclude your remarks if possible, if that would be all right with the Judge, with you recognized. Uh, thank you for bailing me out, Mr. Representative. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, number one, the appellate process is, is available to you. In a case like this, there is an appellate process. There was an appellate process. It worked. Number two, and we haven't talked a lot about that, <clears throat> and that is the Board of Judicial Conduct. When I was investigating and prosecuting, it was called the Court of the Judiciary. But it's basically the same thing. It's created a little bit differently. Uh, but the legislature, the legislative branch of government, appoints eight of the 16 members, exactly half. Judicial branch or judicial organizations appoint six. And the governor, the executive branch of government, appoints two. That is a body created to handle judicial misconduct, which is exactly what is alleged in House Resolution 23. It works as a part of that process. The uh, Board of Judicial Conduct can recommend to this body removal. Removal. That's how it works. Uh, and and in to one of the questions I asked 
when's the last time you remember something like this happened? Uh, my recollection, and this is kind of close to home to me because it, it, it occurred uh, in a judicial district uh, in which I served. Uh, back in the early 90s, my recollection is, and, and if I'm incorrect, I apologize, my recollection is uh, the court of the judiciary at that time uh, recommended removal. I know, I know there was a federal trial and conviction uh, of the judge, and my recollection is that it was, I believe, before the legislature, but there was a resignation uh, prior to the legislature uh, acting. At least that's my recommendation. And I, I close by saying this. I believe in the separation of powers. It is entrenched in me. I love the separation of powers. Judges don't have any business engaged in politics except for election purposes. I, I know that they have to engage in political activity to get elected. They have to meet uh, members of the public. What House Bill 23 does, in my view, is this. It undercuts the fair and impartial judiciary. Judges are out there today wondering, well, I've got this tough case. If I decide it this way, I'm afraid I may make someone in the legislature mad. As a matter of fact, if I follow the law, I may make 66 of them mad. You see, it, is, it has already had a chilling effect upon a fair and impartial jury. What kind of judge would you want? What kind of judge do you want to hear your case? Someone who's afraid they're going to lose their job simply because they've got a tough case and try to follow the law? To me, it's a matter of common sense. I'm sorry if I took too long, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that. Uh, next on the list, I have, um, excuse me, Representative Garrett, do you have any follow-up to that? Okay, thank you. And next on the list, I have Representative Parkson and Representative Clements. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Judge. Um, your last comment, your last statement, repeat that last statement one more time, if you don't mind. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Representative, for the, for the question. Uh, judges are out there now. They're aware of what Chancellor uh, Lyle is facing today. And they're wondering, if I render an unpopular decision in a hot case, you know, we just call them hot cases, hot potatoes, do I stand a chance of losing my job? Okay. Representative Parkson, can you follow up? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Judge. And, and, and Judge, that statement scares the life out of me because it, 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 has, it, it has created influence on the judicial branch even before this legislation was presented. And, and it, it really, and this is to the crux, and I, I love and respect my, my colleague, uh, um, Representative Rudd, uh, and 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 I understand how he feels, and you know, with bringing this uh, this resolution, but the the influence on the judiciary committee, I mean, on the judicial branch, it 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 scares me. And and even before the resolution was brought, because the resolution was being brought, it already influenced the judicial branch because she had to recuse herself from cases that were already before her because of the, the threat of this um, resolution. And that's, con that's, that's concerning. Um, it, 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 things like this remove that balance of power. And, and it, 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 it has the potential to um, uh, put us in a space that that is honestly dangerous to every single citizen in the state of Tennessee. You know, I don't, I don't, I remember, uh, you know, when I when I first heard about the uh, the resolution, and and I and I thought about it, and 
and I get it. I understand, you know, I understand the concern of my colleague. I do. I understand the concern of my colleague. Um, but, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a, a, a sledgehammer being applied um, in, in this situation. And, 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 and there's a lot of uh, casualties or uh, potential casualties that can come about, you know, if we pass such legislation. And, and honestly, even whether this, this resolution moves forward or does not, there will still be a lingering threat that all judges will, you know, have in the back of their mind, unfortunately. So, you know, I just, I, I'm, you know, this one, this one sinks to, to my soul, to the core of me. You know, as, as honestly, not just as a Tennessean, but as an American, uh, you know, you know, if we set a precedence like this, so I'm, 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 I'm truly concerned about it. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Rep Representative Clements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and Judge, thank you for being here today. First of all, I want to thank you as a Rule 31 listed general civil mediator. I appreciate you being a trailblazer in judicial mediations and the work you've done towards creating a more efficient judicial process for litigants and, and everyone involved. Uh, my, my question is, given your record and what you spent years doing, um, can you speak again to what, I, th I think one pr constitutional provision makes pretty clear impeachment, the, the impeachment provision is pretty clear about requires criminal activity. The removal provision that I think is the subject of this debate can you speak as to what is contemplated by the word cause or what valid legal cause for removal is, given your experience in making those determinations? Judge Riley, you're recognized. Would you like a scholarly answer to that? <laughs> because, um, my, because my answer is I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I have no idea, and you know, it's kind of like uh, the language in the federal constitution about high crimes and misdemeanors. Nobody seems to know exactly uh, what that is, but I will echo uh, the words uh, of your uh, co-representative. Thank you, sir. It's a sledgehammer, and you don't use a sledgehammer very often, rarely. There is a time and a place for it, or it wouldn't be there, but it is an extreme remedy. It is like the death penalty for a judge, and I'm sorry I can't go. Uh, I'm not able to answer your question any further. Representative Clemens, any follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Well, then let me simply ask, is this instance that's before us a cause, in your opinion, as one attorney and former judge, a cause for removal? A judge who was randomly assigned a case, adjudicating a case before her, and ruling on the constitutionality of a state statute. Is that cause for removal? Judge Riley, you're recognized. Absolutely, positively, no. Thank you. And That's all, Mr. I, I, if I may continue. Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, my understanding is she was interpreting a state statute, your legislation, in light of the Tennessee Constitution con concerning our right to vote. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your question. Very good. Uh, Representative Griffey, I have you next, sir. Thank you for being patient down there. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Riley, it's good to see you again. Yes. I always enjoy coming to your CLE uh, conferences, and uh, we're both uh, West Tennessee boys, and uh, sometimes some of us may not be the sharpest uh, crayon in the box, but I like to say that, you know, uh, we can read between the lines sometimes and, and recognize a, a motive and intent uh, that may not be spelled out crystal clear for everyone else. I don't know if you might agree with that. But let me ask you this, Judge. You, you keep up with public events. You would agree with it or not that there was a coordinated, planned, financed uh, endeavor to litigate state election laws across the country prior to the 2016 election to enable people to vote by mail. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Before we answer that, let's, let's, 
I just want to be sure we stay on the resolution itself. I just and, and I'm going to let him answer that question. But let's just try to, to stay on the resolution. I think we may get off path a little bit, but go ahead and answer that. Uh, my answer to that is I don't know that, uh, but I know that uh, that this was a big problem across the United States about people voting and uh, and. Uh, uh, unwillingness of some to vote because of COVID and the issues that it created. President Griffin, any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Judge, let me ask you this. Are you aware that Mark Elias with uh, Coley, Perkins Coley uh, engaged in a number of these lawsuits across the country and they've been funded, actually funded the one here in Tennessee that came before Chancellor Lyle? I don't know that. Okay. I, I'm not saying it's not true. I, I just don't know that. Uh, Representative Griffith, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge, let me ask you this. Uh, is there a recognized constitutional right under Tennessee law to vote by absentee? Judge Riley, you're recognized. Uh, I don't believe uh, uh, my recollection of the Constitution is there's no specific provision that talks about uh, voting by absentee. But there is a clear concept in our Constitution about the right to vote and exercising the right to vote. Representative Griffey. And so you would agree that the right to vote is a constitutional right, uh, but the manner is left to the legislature pursuant to as Article 2, Section Clause 1, 2, and 4 of the U.S. Constitution and the state legislature. Would you agree with that? I, I agree. Riley. You recognize that. I apologize, Mr. Chair. Uh, I agree the legislature can do that. However, I also agree that if the legislature doesn't do that, then the judge may have to decide whether there's a constitutional issue. President Griffin, can you follow up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, judge, you, you practiced law for, I guess, what, 40, 50 years? Maybe, maybe I practiced more? practiced law a very short time before going on the bench, and uh, since leaving the bench, I've not and been too engaged in the active practice. Although I've got two pro bono murder cases now. But, but, Griffey, you're but, but you've been on the bench involved with law your entire adult, adult life and so forth. Um, what should, is it appropriate for any judge to institute policy from the bench if maybe it's a matter that's best left for the legislature? Would you comment on your opinion on that? Uh, judge Riley, you're recognized. Generally speaking, judges should not. Uh, uh, I hope you can't hear my phone ringing. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it's, uh, it's, I hear it through my hearing aid. Uh, in answer to your question, judges should not institute policy that is contrary to uh, state statutes, that is contrary to uh, judicial court rules or any of the court rules. So making policy can be dangerous. There are certain policies that judges can institute that are constitutional and legitimate. Representative Griffey. And thank you, Judge. And let me ask you this. There's, have you also, ex with your experience on the bench, that sometimes if you get a case that comes before you and there's not a clear right under the Tennessee Constitution or U.S. Constitution uh, and the parties still want to litigate it, sometimes it's best to maybe let the parties take that up to a higher court rather than the trial court trying to fashion or create a questionable right. Uh, you, you for, sort of judicial deference to the higher courts above them when it comes to recognizing un, hence to for uh, unrecognized rights. Judge Riley, you're recognized. Uh, the, the problem with that is if the judge avoids the issue and says, let them decide, that's not a proper appeal. The judges are expected to rule, to create a record, and to have something to appeal from. Representative Griffey, you recognize it. But if a right didn't originally exist, shouldn't the judge just interpret the laws that's there, and then if a party's not satisfied with that, they certainly have that right to take that dispute up to a higher court. Absolutely. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Judge. Good to see you again. Thank Good to you. see you, sir. Members, any, any follow-up uh, for Judge Riley? Seeing none. Thank you for that, sir. And I have no one else on the list. So with that, you're excused. Thank you.
And we're going to go back into session. Previous question has been called. That is, well, the, the point of order, if, if, you, if that's what you're asking, is this. Representative Rudd had, had said that he was going to request a roll. We went out of session. As soon as we came back in session, there's been a, a motion made for previous question. That's a non-debatable motion. There was no motion made to roll this bill by any member of this committee. So right now we're on the motion for previous, we're on previous question. Is there any objection? I see objection. So we're going to vote on previous question. All those in favor of previous questions, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. no. Ayes have it. We're voting on House Resolution 23 to move to Civil Justice Full Committee. All those in favor, say aye. Those opposed, say no. No. No's have it. Bill fails. Yes. That has to be done before the vote's taken. That has to be done before the vote's taken. That that request what that request was not made. It was not made. That request was not made, sir. It's my understanding, Mr. Chairman, that even after a vote has taken place, that the th if three members on the committee request a roll call vote, that that can take place, and I'm requesting that. Well, that could be a question for the clerk's office. It's, it's my interpretation of our rules that that cannot be done. Any request on the vote has to be made before, by the sponsor before the vote. Okay, that's my understanding. And even if so, that request was not made. I, I, for purposes of the record, I do object to the respectfully object to the rulings of the uh, chair, and, that, and that's fine, and that, that's perfectly fine. I respect that as well. It's part of being chairman. Okay, members, looks like we may have time for. Looks like we have ten minutes left, so let's try to get a couple more bills finished up before we move out today. Um, that brings us to item number. So item number ten, Representative Williams. Item ten. Unless I missed one. Okay, Representative, um, item eight, eight uh, House Bill 890 was rolled for a week. That item was rolled for one week by Representative Doggett. Uh, Representative Williams was item nine, or excuse me, item 10. I do not see him, so we'll, we'll roll him to the end of today's docket without objection. End of the day's calendar, item 10, House Bill 159. That brings us to item number, item number 11 by Representative Lafferty. Motion. Second. Second. And Representative, we may be in a situation, because I know that I had uh, Elizabeth St Stroker and I had uh, Colonel Matt Perry here to testify. I think this bill is probably going to take a bit of time, and we may not be able to finish it today uh, if, we get, if we get started. But if you want to go ahead and present, present the bill and then roll it, or I just, we're just not going to be able to finish it. I, I know that. See the writing on the wall. Here Would I, if we present it today, I would still be able to speak if we had, uh, when that did come up, when those other speakers were present? Members, and, and let's do this. I'm going to make a motion to roll all the bills left on the calendar to next week. That won't count against you or anyone else because we're, we're running out of time. It's for time purposes. So that objection, we're going to roll all the bills next week. Representative Griffey, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, I didn't know if there's one quick bill that may not take long. We might want to try to pick up. I don't know if uh, Representative Grills. That's correct. Bill. Let's, let's I don't do know if that. he's got testimony or not. Something quick that might help assist the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're going to, without objection, we're going to roll all remaining bills except item number 12, House Bill 1137, because that one will be quick to next, uh, to next week. Without objection, we'll do that. We'll take up item 12, and that'll be our last matter for the day. Motion. Second. Second. A, uh, another pandemic, the governor of the health department from being able to shut down uh, religious activities or churches, and that is strictly the church itself. It's not uh, upward or any other potential uh, basketball programs, uh, uh, football, anything extracurricular. It's strictly the church services themselves. We had a couple of a uh, little bit of issues with the governor's office just for clerical issues, but if uh, um, 
that's something we're working out. I believe there's going to be an amendment at the, if, if we can pass this bill onto the full committee just for clerical issues. Very good. We'd, we'd put this on at the on the full committee, whatever the will of the uh, the chair is or the committee. And I'm, and, I, and I'm okay with clerical amendments as long as it doesn't change the substantive form, the material form of the bill. Well, if it does, Mr. Chairman, I will. I promise to bring it back, and we'll. If you're not satisfied that it does what I say it will, I'll bring it back. Thank you for that. Members, do we have any questions for uh, Representative Grill? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote to send House Bill 1137 to Civil Justice Full Committee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The bill moves on. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Me. And, I want, and I want to thank, before we end today, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here today, for participating today. I know we had a, a lengthy discussion on on a few bills and, and, uh, and a lot of commentary, and it's much appreciated. So I'll, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you, and we'll see everyone back here next week.